amazing film. It's the first in-house documentary that Sea Shepherd has made, full-length documentary. Mm. Um, so um, I'm Ethan Wolf. I'm the New York City chapter coordinator. I was also in Costa Rica in 2015 for the end of the campaign. We're just going to have a, a Q&A now um, uh, with Captain Paul Watson, who I don't really think needs much of an introduction. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but you know, our Thanks. founder, Thank you. Um, our spiritual leader in this movement here. And then Andrea Gordon, um, who was the executive producer of the film, um, initiated the Pearl campaign in 2015, um, as well as spearheaded the project. Then what can I do? Can I call somebody? Can I write to somebody? Because I want to go there and see that place, but what good is going there if you're going to see that happen? Don't they realize that they got to really preserve that? You know, so people can come and see that. I don't think they want people like us to come and see that. Well, Costa Rica has a reputation as being a very green country, but unfortunately we found out that the reality is when it comes to a lot of species, particularly marine species, it's not the case. So really the key in Costa Rica with the turtles, the first thing is to actually get the laws changed so that the sale of turtle eggs is no longer legal. And then using that combined with efforts of education and direct action on the beaches is the long-term key. When I was down there, there was a school right across the street from where we were living in Limon. Um, and uh, we had several Spanish-speaking volunteers who went across the street, asked if they could do a presentation, um, and they ended up uh, doing, I think, three or four presentations that day, and the principal of that school sent them over to another school to do presentations a few days later. So there, there were definitely people interested and had never really thought about that the turtles are, you know, um, are a natural, really natural part of their country and, and what, uh, something they have to protect. Well, the problem with the ecotourism is, uh, you know, they sell it, they're selling Costa Rica as this uh, ecological paradise, uh, but it's all public relations. The, the reality of it is that there's too many people making too much money off of exploiting those, those resources. It's not just turtles, it's also sharks. It's uh, so many uh, species that are being exploited in that country. I mean, how much can we do to kind of maintain the fight for more protected areas? 
Well, I, I sometimes almost think that uh, what we have to do is uh, wait for a minor, hopefully minor, ecological collapse so that nature kicks us in the ass and shows us how things are going to have to be done and we're not going to survive. I don't think that people realize just how um, tenuous this entire thing is. Uh, the best example I know is that since 1950, we've had a 40% diminishment in phytoplankton populations in the world, and phytoplankton provides uh, 70 to 80% of the oxygen that we breathe. If phytoplankton disappears from the planet, we die. It's as simple as that, but you know, you ask your average person if the, what the connection is, it, they're oblivious. They don't care, they don't know, they don't want to know, but things, we're, we're, we survive on this planet because of the grace of just a, a very few species. At the beginning of the film, it's mentioned the importance of Costa Rica in terms of the turtle population. Uh, how are conservation efforts elsewhere in the world for, for turtles? Uh, turtle conservation, conservation efforts in other parts of the world. Well, I, I think, you know, Andre, you're also, we're also working, of course, in Honduras and Florida and uh, Colombia, different places. So it just depends on, on the country as far as the turtle conservation efforts. One of the most endangered turtle populations is the eastern Pacific leatherback. Uh, and in some places that population has plummeted 97% in just 30 years. And it's particularly striking because it's, they, the turtles have been around for over 100 million years and for their population to disappear by 97% in 30 years means that they're already gone in some places. And the key is really protecting their nesting sites because even with all the turtles that get killed from bycatch from fishing and from plastic and from all the other problems, you know, they can survive that more than if people, you know, if people keep stealing their eggs from all the nesting beaches, there's no way they can survive. And so that's why it's, you know, making sure that we can get the beaches protected for each and every turtle that we can save. You know, that, as the film says, that's one that might come back. Other than, of course, um, volunteering and coming out, but if that's not a possibility for some reason, what are the three things, uh, if I could ask you, Paul, that you would recommend that people like us in a city environment can do to express our support in an active way? I think the most important thing really is to make uh, your views known to the government of Costa Rica and the other countries that are involved, but uh, you know, through the embassy or the consulates here and uh, let them know that uh, you know about the situation and that you're concerned about it. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, I, I don't really support when people say they're going to boycott Costa Rica, tourism boycott of Costa Rica. I don't really support that because a lot of the people who are on our side in Costa Rica actually depend upon on that. And so we're punishing people who are actually our, our allies. There is a lot of support in, uh, in Costa Rica. There's a lot of people who are very angry about uh, what happened to Jairo. And uh, so we shouldn't alienate uh, those people. But it's really the most important thing is to put pressure on the uh, on the government of Costa Rica. So to basically to close down Ostianal is a... That's one of the things. There should be no legal uh, outlet for that because it's like the ivory trade, for instance. Uh, as long as you have legal ivory in the world, then contraband or, or, or poached ivory can be marketed mm -hmm. through that uh, loophole. And they said, well, this is all legal because it came through here and here are the papers. Of course, the papers are all forged. But if you eliminate it completely, make it totally illegal, then there could be no excuse for anybody buying or selling. Not many people also realize that over the last 10 years, over 1,000 people have been murdered for trying to protect the environment. And for, we don't really hear about this unless there's somebody well known, uh, you know, whether it be a, a Diane Fossey or even, or, or even Jairo. But people are dying all the time, and a lot of them are indigenous peoples, uh, and the most of them, uh, I'd say 70% of all of these murders take place in Central or South America, the rest in Africa primarily. I have been reading about the plankton issue. What, um, what makes it not become more of an issue in the ecology world for people to be screaming about it that this is a serious, serious issue and nothing's being done about it. Is this sort of like climate change where it's like, there's like a massive consensus, but people just like forget about it right now? Well, one of the problems is our media culture and plankton is not, they're not cute. I mean, nobody even knows what they look like, really. I mean, and uh, unless, unless something is cute, then, uh, you know, television isn't really interested. 
you know, we have a lot of campaigns protecting like everything from sea cucumbers to, uh, you know, to uh, toothfish and, uh, you know, you have to, you, in order to get people focused on it, like uh, with the president's show Ocean Warriors on the toothfish campaign, you have to really sell the drama, the drama of the chase, people risking their lives, the passion of the, of the crew in order to get that message across. Uh, it's not, uh, you know, some, some animals like baby seals or dolphins are a lot easier to focus attention on. But that's really the responsibility uh, and the fault of the media because uh, the media makes all these rules that we uh, have to work our way around and through. There's just too many people making too much money off of uh, this exploitation, so it's really hard to work our, our way through that. Uh, but I, what I find the, af the absolutely most significantly dangerous thing that is happening is the reduction of plankton. And one of the reasons for that is the diminishment of whales. Like every day, one blue whale uh, defecates three tons of fecal material into the ocean, which is rich in nitrogen, rich in iron, which are the primary nutrients for phytoplankton. So when you diminish the whale populations, you diminish the phytoplankton populations because whales are, in effect, the farmers of the ocean. It's called the whale pump. They bring nutrients up from the depths up to the surface to feed the phytoplankton. Wipe out the whales, you pretty much wipe out the phytoplankton. So everything in nature is interconnected and everything is interdependent. And that's what we're doing. We're diminishing the biodiversity and we're diminishing interdependence. And because of the law of finite resources, we're literally stealing the carrying capacity of these other species, therefore contributing to further diminishment of diversity and interdependence. And there's only one road that leads to, and that is uh, ecological collapse. And humanity will not survive that. I get this all the time. What are you doing for people? Well, what we're doing for people is more significant than what anybody on this planet is doing for people, and that is saving the ground upon which they stand and makes it possible for them to be alive. There is nothing more important in this world than protecting biodiversity in our ocean, more important than finding a cure for cancer, more important than anything, because if the ocean dies, we die. Do you think that will be a subject of a further film that you would do? Because this is, seems like such a complex issue that I don't think people understand. I don't really have to ask, Andre. I don't do films. <laughs> I'm on your shoulders. Show. Uh -huh. We are doing television with Ocean Warriors is on right now, uh, and with uh, Vulcan and Discovery and Animal Planet and that. And we, um, you know, we're trying to get more and more. It is very, very difficult because. Uh, uh, you know, mainstream media is really reluctant to address these, uh, these issues. And the only way to package that really is to play the, by the rules that the media gives us to play by, which uh, I've always said there's only four elements of any news story, sex, violence, scandal, and celebrity. And if you don't have one of those elements, you don't have a story and nobody's going to be paying attention to it. So that's why we have to use those elements. Um, one of the things, for instance, 40 years ago, uh, I learned this lesson when we took Bridget Bardot out to the ice flows in, uh, in eastern Canada to focus attention on the baby seals. And uh, that's, the revelation was incredible because we had been trying to get people to pay attention to this for years and suddenly she just lies down on the ice face cheek to cheek with a baby seal and we got every cover of every magazine in the world. And that's uh, why this next March we're going to take uh, Pamela Anderson out to redo that whole thing and, uh, you know, to keep that going that way because they can't resist it. For example, uh, just this week I wrote a speech or to be read to Putin and the Russian government. Now, they're not going to listen to me, but Pamela Anderson delivered the speech and they listened to her. So, uh, so this is the kind of games that you have to play. You know, we talk about, we used to say biodiversity is so important. You go to museums on the land. But I don't know if I was mentioning to you with the explorers, whatever, but we don't know about the biodiversity in the ocean. I mean, I'm like I could pronounce acidification, the bleaching of the corals. I'm putting it out there, and I'm trying to get people's reaction. There is so much we don't, they come and they go, probably more so in the ocean than on the land. Such oh, biodiversity, absolutely. we don't even know of. Biodiversity in the ocean is much more, more important, important than, than the biodiversity land. on the land. Yeah. But one begets the other anyhow. Well, the problem is, is that uh, the planet could survive without life on land. Right. Can't survive without life on the ocean. Uh, but it's also interesting is what our understanding of what the ocean is. I mean, most people, when you say the ocean, you know it's that Atlantic Ocean out there. It isn't. 
This planet is the ocean, uh, and it's everywhere. Uh, it's the water in the sea, it's the water underground, it's the water in the atmosphere, it's the water locked up in the ice, and it's the water that is in every cell of every plant and animal on this, on this planet. That is water in constant circulation, which is the ocean. This is the planet ocean, it's not the planet Earth. Uh, but because we're land-dwelling creatures, we're biased towards the, the land. But the reality is, it is the ocean. And therefore, when you affect any part of it, whether it be in the ice, underground, or whatever, you're affecting the entire, the entire ocean. After all those years, is there any movement up in the higher politic regions that shows that they might change their their view on, on, on these <coughs> issues, or is it still hardcore environmentalist against money? I haven't seen any sign of any change uh, coming, but everything we do takes time. Uh, you know, we've been fighting the killing of pilot whales in the Faroe Islands since 1983, uh, so we can't expect to win these things overnight. Uh, you just never give up. That's why we call our campaign in Taiji, uh, Japan, Operation Infinite Patience. Um, a lesson that I learned many years ago when I, I was a, a medic at, with the American Indian Movement during the occupation of Wounded Knee in 1973. And uh, we were surrounded by 1,500 uh, federal troops and uh, then plus the FBI, U.S. Marshals, about 2,000 altogether. They were firing 20,000 rounds a night into the village. And um, I went up to Russell Means, who was the leader of the American Indian Movement, and I said to him, I said, Russell, we don't have any hope of winning here. We can't possibly win against these odds. I mean, why are we here? And Russell said something to me I'll never forget. He said, well, we're, we're not here because we're concerned about winning or losing. Uh, uh, that shouldn't be anything that we're thinking about. We're not here because, uh, we, you know, we can beat these overwhelming odds. We're here because it's the right thing to do. It's the only thing to do. We're here because of future generations. And uh, we just have to carry on. And, and he was right. I mean, that was the beginning of a movement. But we lost. But the problem with being an environmental activist is that our victories are always temporary. But our defeats can be permanent because it'll always come back. You know, we can beat them here, but 10 years later we're fighting them again because the forces of greed are very, very strong. I guess it's almost like Star Wars, you know, the, good, <laughs> you know, the, 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 the bad force and the good force and whatever like that. But we have never to forget that we're fighting for life. Uh, we're fighting for all future generations. And just, just to add one thing to uh, Yoakum's question about Costa Rica in particular, uh, as far as Ashinal, that started as a as an experiment back in the 80s by a university. And, and one of the problems in Costa Rica is that, that a lot of times the wrong question is being asked in the sense that scientists have been looking at what the population is of the Ashinal turtles rather than overall what the population is of turtles coming to nest in Costa Rica and how Ashinal impacts the entire population in Costa Rica. So I, I think that the international attention and the awareness has not been there for what's happening in Costa Rica, and that a lot of people aren't even aware that it's legal to sell turtle eggs in Costa Rica. So hopefully the film and, you know, and unfortunately Jairo's death as well, you know, to make it mean something, it really needs to be a catalyst for change and for setting an example of what's possible and what, what a difference and an impact individuals can make. You would expect a politics system that relies on tourism that much to be sensitive to input from an organization like Sea Shepherd, to be sensitive to a death like Jaros. And so I'm 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 just looking for what what is what is it that stops them or that just makes them completely oblivious to to this why why is it that they do not respond at all to any of this uh, to any of this energy put into the right movement
The Costa Rican people are very much aware of that. The Costa Rican government invests incredible amounts of money in promoting Costa Rica as an ecological paradise for eco-tourism and everything. And they get very, very angry if anybody tries to, uh, you know, break that bubble. But the real problem is that people in very high positions in Costa Rica make a lot of money through this kind of corruption. Uh, the INCOPESCA is the agency that's in charge of uh, fisheries enforcement. Uh, we found out two years ago that one of its directors was the biggest drug lord in Costa Rica. Uh, we found out that, uh, well, the, the, the president of INCOPESCA is under investigation for corruption. The fact that uh, th th there's so much uh, drug trafficking going around, shark finning operation. I mean, Costa Rica is the largest exporter of shark fins out of Central America. Going, going to China. Uh, their reaction to anybody exposing that is anger and hostility. And that's why they come after us and everything. They just feel that, you know, they, they can intimidate us out of uh, not being in, involved in it. And a lot of the Costa Rican people are very, very um, intimidated and very angry and frustrated by the fact that uh, their government is, is doing this. The current president promised to change that. And as soon as he got into office, broke every promise he made. Very familiar to us up here in Canada and the United States. But uh, the problem is, you know, until we have a law, we, I re really think we should have a universal law that if you don't, if the first promise you break, you're out of office. You know, that might solve the problem. But, uh, you know, the, right now, basically politicians will lie and say anything to get into, into power. And then once they're in power, they go to work for the people who really, they really represent, certainly not us. It really should be a United Nations thing that every nation should have an input on, on this. And also when you're talking about Costa Rica, you're looking at probably one of the greatest areas of biodiversity on the planet and that actually benefits or the consequences are on all of us. So therefore we all should have a, an input on that. Right. Just one last question in the back. Hi, I'm the founder of uh, One Green Planet. We're a media company that um, fights with the environment, and we're trying hard to do that. The, the biggest question we get from our readers, majority of them which are based in the U.S., they're, they're very quick to point to countries like Costa Rica or countries in Asia and Africa and say the government needs to do more, while ignoring the fact that we, in many ways, with our daily choices, are contributing to many of these problems. Um, so what would you say is the single most imp impactful thing uh, someone in America sitting here in New York City can do um, to have a positive impact on the environment? Is it stopping to consume seafood and all animal products? Is, is it cutting down on plastic? What can we do to protect the oceans um, while it's sitting right here and kind of powerless in many ways, or seemingly powerless? I mean, I, th I think you already answered your question there. It, um, it, it is. Is there, is there anything else? We can do? I mean, you know, these, these are the first, probably really the first two steps, like eliminating animal products from your diet and eliminating plastic from your lifestyle. Um, and I, eat, particularly in New York City, eliminating animal products from your diet is an incredibly easy thing to do. Eliminating plastic is a lot harder, but there's ways that you can really reduce it, and you're going to be reducing the carbon footprint and your, um, and I think it's one of the things that, that Paul uh, has said that um, I always say when speaking to people about Sea Shepherd is the greatest predators of marine wildlife are now the animals on factory farms. A and that is something that people mm. just don't think about is all of these fish that are being caught up, um, many of them are just being fed to cattle and to, to cows and to chickens and to pigs for other, for humans who eat those animals. Forty percent, yeah. Yeah, it's about 40% of all the fish taken from the ocean is converted into fish feed for pigs, chickens, uh, domestic house cats, domestic salmon, fur-bearing animals. So uh, we live in a world right now where, uh, where actually chickens in Europe on factory farms alone, just those chickens, eat more fish than all of the puffins and albatrosses in the ocean. And uh, also I always like to point out is that domestic house cats eat more fish than all of the seals in the North Atlantic Ocean. That's a world out of balance and uh, we need to restore that balance. All right. So I, I'm, I'm sorry, I know that, that there are a few more questions. We're, we're kind of running out of time here. Um, 
again, I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. Um, we've got a little bit more time in the space outside, so definitely check out. Um, we've got a lot of great uh, products that help uh, merchandise and, and some art, but all that money goes right back into Sea Shepherd so that we can put our ships at sea, so that we can put uh, ground crew on the beaches in Costa Rica and Panama and in Mexico and Honduras and Florida. Um, so please uh, definitely check it all out um, and learn about how you can get more involved. And uh, thanks to Andrea Gordon for spearheading this project through.